Now we go on to our next and last panel discussion for the day on wealth creation through AIFs and PMS. To engage our guests in this conversation, we invite our moderator, Ms. Nisha Podar, Managing Editor, Times Experiences on the Days. A round of applause for her. Thank you. And our learned panelists, Ms. Soumya Rajan, Founder and CEO, Waterfield Advisors. Mr. Raghav Iyengar, CEO, 361 Asset. I can't hear those claps. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Sudhir Warrior, Deputy CEO, Multiples Alternate Asset Management Limited. And Mr. Ashish Gupta, Chief Investment Officer, Access Mutual Fund. Over to you, Ms. Poda. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us here. And it's a pleasure uh, to really conduct uh, a panel discussion on such, a, such an interesting topic and with such uh, abundance and experience right here, also because they cater to the rich clients, right? Uh, so we are talking about uh, wealth creation uh, by AI AIFs as well as PMS, and it is a very big growing category in India, and they have really become a very pronounced source of investment in the last few years, also because of the uh, equity market uptick that we have seen. So my first question to you, Raghav, how have you seen the rise of uh, the AIFs and PMS in the country in the last few years, uh, what has been the growth as well as the category of investors coming in? So it's a, we started with a very low base. You yes. know, so I think uh, we must take that into account. But the last seven year growth numbers are something like 40% CAGR. So as I'm speaking to you today, it's about 10 lakh crores. Everything. Of course, a lot of it has gone into if I look at categories, obviously the biggest category which has attracted money is real estate, yes. then followed by private equity in various avatars, yes. and then a little bit of credit. Hmm. So in that sense, it's very differentiated from what is available, let's say, in the normal mutual fund space. Right. And another category of investors has been the private equity funds. Of course, uh, the foreign uh, PE funds have raised and also got huge amount of returns from the Indian equity markets. And uh, so have the homegrown private equity also become a very important part of investment cycle for many companies fueling their growth. Uh, so over there, uh, Sudhir, of course, uh, you know, one of the aspects that a lot of private equity uh, players used to raise 10 years back is that how do we make big ticket investments because our equity markets do not have uh, the depth to uh, really digest huge exits. Now with CoForge transaction, that really changed and after that the number of block deals that have given super normal returns to the private equity, this space has become undoubtedly one of the very, very good return areas. So Sudhir, how do you see as a homegrown private equity firm the scope and scale of the rise of alternate investments from the private equity side. Yeah, as you said, uh, Nisha, the fact that private equity in India has grown very large. The industry has grown, has seen large deals, has seen large exits and so on. But I would still say that a bulk of it, while we talk about AI, AIFs and PMS, mm -hmm. the fact is that it is not as homogeneous as mutual funds are. It is highly distinct in terms of real estate funds, either whether the AIF category one, category two, even within category two, it is very different. So when we talk about private equity, or I would say private equity and venture capital to the extent that all of these cater to private companies in a manner of speaking, but that is still much smaller from a domestic participation perspective. That's and right. the potential therefore of substantially increasing the allocation of wealth of India, whether it comes directly or whether it comes through institutions. My sense is for a substantial part in the early stage, these industries and alternatives would be institution-led rather than direct retail-led. If you look at uh, developed markets, etc., it's been largely initially the pension funds, etc., which invested into private equity and then the retail and the HNI family office boom has recently started where 
all of the large funds have started approaching them. Yes. So from when you look at it from that perspective, we are probably unlike the mutual fund discussions that we heard where we are saying that the domestic participation has reached a level where in the FII participation is now no longer sp spoken about. That's right. Private equity is still substantially internationally uh, kind of uh, uh, led, even mm. for domestic funds like us where we have a significant domestic participation, it is still substantially mm. internationally backed. So the wealth participate, the participation of this asset class, which I believe is very, very different from the capital market asset class, and therefore is very interesting from an investor perspective, is yet to really develop in the Indian market. That's right, a lot of growth potential there. And uh, of course, the returns and exit mechanisms uh, gives, it, uh, gives it a fillip nonetheless. But uh, Soumya, of course, Sudhir spoke about another set of investor class which has become very prominent in the recent times is the family offices. You cater to them. How has been the rise and what is the kind of attraction level that you see from the family offices in your kind of business? Um, so, uh, very happy to just be with all of you today. Uh, what's interesting is that even in the family office space, um, in our own portfolio, 50% is still to mutual funds. So, it's not as if this is a category which is ignored or that most family offices actually tend to do more of the exotic stuff that we may be speaking about today. Many of them just want the simple tax efficient compounding that you get through mutual funds. So that was something that may come as a surprise for many of you in the audience. Um, when you look at the growth of AIFs and PMS in portfolios, what we see at Waterfield is that uh, the AIF segment, or what we define as private equity and venture, when I first started in the industry in terms of um, at Waterfield founding the company, it was probably maybe about one or 2% of uh, a family office's portfolio. Today, it's about 15%. And that 15% is a mix of both direct investments that family offices make, as well as fund investing that they do. Um, our sense and what we normally advise to clients is that where it is fund related, you need to take a more concentrated bet. You have to do a lot more diligence around the fund manager. But where you're looking at direct investments, then you really need to spread that out. Um, because otherwise your experience can be very varied. You'll have one which will give you 10x or 15x and you'll think that you're a fund manager yourself, uh, whereas you need to just moderate that expectation. So for us, our, our view has always been, uh, you know, go with funds more. And I think there is an art to even fund manager selection, which is something that we pride ourselves in, in Waterfield across uh, Asset classes. That's right. The choice is so much that selection becomes even more difficult. But one important takeaway from what Somya said is that in any portfolio, uh, of course, a large part, majority of it is governed by mutual funds. So it caters from downright 100 rupees SIPs to the rich high net worth individuals as well. So Ashish, wealth creation, propensity and potential of mutual funds. Sure. So, well, I think uh, the panels before us have spoken about it uh, and actually the discussion has been more in terms of uh, number of investors and the AUM, right? But I think if we want to talk about uh, the wealth creation, so if we look at uh, the data net of inflows, right? So, if I recollect correctly, in 2018, equity AUM was about 8 lakh crores. Uh, today, equity AM, uh, AUM is about 40 lakh crores, right? Uh, give or take. Uh, and over this five, six, pe uh, six year period, uh, incremental inflows into mutual funds has been about 10 lakh crores, right? So the wealth creation that has happened for whatever 40, 45 million people who have invested is about 23 lakh crores, right? So that is the magnitude of wealth creation that has happened and the participation has been much more broad based. If I look at the entire PMS industry, uh, the total number of investors I believe is barely 50,000. So at one end you have 50,000 investors, at the other end you have uh, 50 million investors, right? So I think uh, the scope, the reach of uh, both these is very different. I think as wealth of individuals increase, they need a larger assortment of products, some of which will come from mutual fund itself. So you would have seen last two years more 
uh, thematic funds coming into uh, the market. Uh, you have also seen more AIFs coming. You have also seen uh, 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 a lot more uh, uh, passive funds coming in, right? Yes, and very uh, differentiated products right. have come. So, yes. so I think uh, there is now a spectrum of products available. Yes. Uh, and uh, whether one buys a mutual fund, uh, one creates a portfolio, you can have a barbell where you buy a passive fund and you buy an AIF. Yes. So there are, uh, I think, different avenues that are opening up for investors. And uh, that's always good. There is choice, but I... Uh, I believe, and although, of course, uh, we have alternates on our platform as well, but I just think the sheer scale, the reach, and uh, as Sudhir mentioned, the homogeneity that is available uh, on the mutual fund platform is unparalleled. That's right. And in fact, there have been many milestones for the growth of mutual funds in the country. Like before uh, demonetization, it was not as popular. Then, of course, Amphi with uh, mutual fund Sahi Hai also penetrated the market, educated the market. And now the investment class has really become much more educated. Looking at this whole journey, uh, now, uh, Vishal, it has not just been wealth creation uh, with new products for the investor class. It has opened a lot of business also. Uh, the regulatory system, the overall policy system has also contributed a lot in building this ecosystem. You are an expert in that. Uh, tell us about how you see this journey. Right. No, thanks, Nisha. I think... Uh so what we've heard from all the panels today is that uh, how the growth in the mutual fund industry and the AUM has really expanded and how all the participants have contributed to that. The AIF or the private equity business in India is, is relatively new comparatively. A lot more education has to go in uh, to help in investors understand the risks and the rewards of investing in this community. Uh, the important thing here is that when it was started, it was meant to be a light touch regulation. It was supposed to be a, a, an investment opportunity for uh, discerning investors, for sophisticated investors who knew what they were talking about, needed something more than a PMS or something different from a PMS. And uh, that, I think, has worked really well for the industry. That uh, it's light touch, not that much uh, regulation. There's a respect that the guy who's investing here understands what he's signing up for, and the fund manager is respecting that situation and working accordingly. That's what I think has worked well. The tax laws have also caught up. There is something to be said about why should CAT 3 be different from CAT 2 and stuff like that. But having said that, largely, we think the hands-off approach of the regulator has helped the industry grow. And some of that will probably need to, uh, need to continue. We'll probably have to allow a lot more innovation, recognizing these concepts. And it looks like the regulator is listening uh, they're recognizing that large ticket sizes mean that there is uh, better understanding and therefore you should allow them to do more than, uh, than what a uh, smaller investor could do and therefore there is mutual fund for, funds for them. Leave this for the more sophisticated larger investors and that, mm -hmm. therein lies the opportunity, right? Because you have a class of investors who is able to really have an intelligent conversation with fund managers. Fund managers are able to innovate products suited to them, and that's where you'll see a lot of the growth coming in from. That's right. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, whenever I have spoken uh, to the AIF industry, uh, one thing they always mention is that we are just trying to catch up with the number of regulatory framework and changes that are really coming in on a regular basis. So, Raghav, how does the industry deal with that? Because, of course, the demand is there. You're making money. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot to catch up on. I think my experience comes from the MF space. And uh, so I put, like, you know, if you go and look at the industry, we've had about 30 years. First private sector mutual fund came in 93, 94. And if you remember the famous entry load went away around 2009. I think that 15 years was a bit of wild west. I think we've done all kinds of nonsense in that period. You know, we paid upfront commissions. We did all weird stuff. And after that, uh, the regulation came and got much tighter. Yeah. Same situation was there, somewhat what's happening in AIFs. Mm. And the industry went, what, I think 8x after that. Mm. So my view, regulation is good. Obviously, it cramps operating style. I agree with Vishal because obviously people come here with light touch regulation. That's the expectation. But now we are a 10 lakh crore industry. We can't have light touch regulation. Right. So we need to have some regulation. And I think a lot of it is also built around standardization. Yes. So if you see, there's a new association, the Association of Portfolio Managers of India, APME. 
So they are trying to do interesting stuff around just building distribution, mm. the way funds get reported. Mm. You know, all this was not available three, four, five years back. Right. You had to go to somebody really classy like Swamia's team to get a detailed analysis of what my portfolios look like. Yes. The beauty of mutual funds is that they become very standardized, very simple. Information is easily available. It's very transparent. And more importantly, it's extremely regulated. So I think right. some amount of regulation is okay. Yes. Uh, obviously, I think it's getting a bit onerous right now. Right. And that comes in parts because sometimes the pendulum swings the other way. But I think we are in that space. But I guess it will slowly come back. That's okay. First steps have happened in the budget. Yeah. I think unlisted equities have been bought on par with listed. It used to be a big pain in the neck trying to calculate IRRs, etc. That's all gone. So I think over the next couple of years, my sense is as this product becomes more standardized, more information available, clients, investors trust us. Uh, and more importantly, this is now going to the affluent investor. So it's the 50 lakh, 1 crore, used to be a lot of money maybe 8 years back. Today a 1 crore ticket is not a big amount of money. Yes. So you cannot just assume because somebody is putting 1 crore, they are very, very knowledgeable and they have complete trust in the product. So do you think that this uh, ticket size or the selection criteria should change <laughs> and it get enhanced? That is speculation, Nidhi. I don't know. They've been talking about it for a long time. If it goes up, it's okay because most of the CAT 2 AFs anyway don't take money up front. It's all taken in phases anyway. So it's right. not like very rarely, rarely do you go and plonk a two crore check. Right. So Raghav, uh, thanks for uh, at least uh, pointing out uh, one of the pain points for the industry, uh, of course. But, uh, y you know, a lot of uh, feedback that I've got from the regulatory side is also that there are so many tailor-made and innovative products and first-time products, which if they don't understand the potential of where it can be risky, that's where uh, they put more guardrails. And uh, it's an evolution. Mutual fund has also gone through that cycle and now has become a mass product. Product, while you are a premiumized product. So the, the, cat, the categories are also different, but evolution definitely is certain. It's a newer product uh, right now. And of course, the sophisticated as well as high risk taking clients are the ones which are get attracted or are eligible for uh, these products. But uh, Swamya, so talk to us about uh, the innovation of products, the equity, non-equity side of it and uh, of uh, this, and also how to make it tailor-made for big clients for maximum returns when they have high risk, high return capability. Um, so I think one of the things that family offices do or slightly larger portfolios do is that most people talk about asset allocation and then look at fund manager selection and product selection. Um, for larger portfolios, we actually have the concept of risk pools or understanding what pools of capital you actually have in terms of the risk that you will take for that. Um, and this is really because there are more black swan events happening at higher frequencies, and we need to be prepared for that. And I think there was a question on an earlier panel, how long did it take for, uh, for let's say, uh, for you to recover from a black swan event? A little bit of the study that we've done is that we've seen that the maximum period has been about two years. So it really then means that do you have enough capital in what is a safety pool that you've actually kept aside for a two-year period so that you do not compromise your lifestyle. Um, but what was also interesting from the earlier panel was this whole conversation around debt um, because uh, is that as an asset class, where is it going? Um, I can tell you in the conversations we are having with clients what was earlier asset allocation of equity and debt has now become equity and non-equity. Uh, and the non-equity piece is where you're seeing fixed income, you're seeing REITs, you're seeing invits, you're seeing gold. All those are now coming into the conversation. And I think that's going to only increase as we Somia, see. Somia, I'm glad that you didn't put uh, REIT and invit in the fixed income category at a mutual fund conference. That's a very, very good sign. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing is that the conversation is changing, um, and I think maybe that's the conversation we need to start having with clients as well, mm. because otherwise they just categorize it as almost like debt products, which it's not. So the education part then becomes extremely yes. important. All right. So many new products have come. In fact, I've personally tracked REITs and INVITs. Twelve years back, many professionals got on this bandwagon, and only in the last four or five years, 
they could make it tax efficient enough to be selling and coming out with listings. So that's how long one product takes to get developed uh, in Indian market and be understood and while we are still educating. Uh, but uh, Sudhir, of course, domestic pools of capital. India's affluence is growing. Uh, the sophistication and understanding amongst the investors is growing. And it's a much bigger pie. But private equity, and especially homegrown, it's our own money which needs to fuel our own growth. Absolutely. I think uh, I remember Nilesh talking some few years back that most of Indian companies are actually owned by foreigners and the domestic participation is very less. Something similar, where we have corrected that in mutual funds, but something similar is still the state with private equity in the sense that the A, private equity is an asset class that is extremely important. There is a, there is a, a there is several private companies that are with a lot of situations, like for example, you can roll up, do acquisitions, you can turn around companies, you can kind of do at an early stage to growth capital, you can s resolve a family issue by entering. All of these requires private equity solutions to come in. So it's a very important asset class that is there. It is very different from mutual funds. For example, if you come to our office, you will not see any Bloomberg terminal, nobody looking at the ticker. The questions will be, what is the diligence? Oh, ye company mein CFO chhod diya, ab replace karna hai, either something else has happened. So it is about truly partnering with companies and holding companies from one stage to the other. And there is wealth creation that happens there. So there is an importance to kind of invest into this asset class. It is important that this asset class is stable in the long run. Mm -hmm. Finally, in any economy, stability comes when domestic capital starts participating in a big way into that particular asset class. It is domestic pools of capital. You never know tomorrow what's going to happen, which is suddenly because I remember attending conferences in Hong Kong and stuff in 2014, 15, 16 where people would come, would be meeting you and say, oh, I just escaped from that conference. I was swamped by Indian GPs. And so that is the way people used to look at us to today where the India panel is where most people are there. But these cycles keep coming and the way to stabilize it by domestic participation. And today, yes. unfortunately, that is still, I would say, very low. While there are people like so, Soumya, et cetera, who try yeah. to do it with family offices where this 15% is across a lot of asset classes. Right. I would still say the need for fund of funds like what they are doing. Yes. More fund of funds which can get, because it is a complex asset class. Yes. You need to evaluate fund managers. There is governance because these are private companies yeah. where information is not available. There are conflict situations which are there between the, between fund managers themselves, transfer from one fund to the other. For governance of that, you need to pool together even private capital into fund of fund kind of structures and then invest into private equity fund. We are just not there in terms of evolution of the market. And that's the sad part that it is still continues to be foreign. Dominant. There was a time even our equity markets had FII hot money, which we used to popularly call it. And our market used to fall and rise only backed by FII mood swings on a regular basis and now that has dramatically changed. So her hope is not lost on this also. <laughs> I, I just wanted to come in on one comment that Sudhir made, which is really um, the choice of fund manager in this asset class on private equity and venture is extremely important because when you do the diligence around the top quartile fund managers and even the second quartile, the differential that we've seen in private equity has been as much as 8 to 10% in terms of the gross IRRs. And in venture, it's as, as much as 15 to 20%. So you could have a very different experience depending on which fund manager you've actually allocated to, which is much more stark in private markets than it is in public markets. Right. And uh, also in mergers and acquisitions, uh, it was worrying that uh, not a single company could do a large transaction without a private equity support. So we have actually come to that. Uh, so its prominence, of course, has increased. But our Indian company's ability to really digest large acquisitions for their own growth has substantially lowered. But uh, moving away from this, Ashish, uh, to the favorite topic now of discussion and a hot topic of discussion in the industry is also the new asset class. And of course, a big benefit coming in for the mutual fund industry. Tell us about it. 
So I think uh, we still need to wait for the, the regulations to come on that front to really say uh, it's a big benefit or not. And in fact, uh, actually I was quite uh, surprised when Vishal was talking about uh, regulatory burden, uh, whether it's on our AIF side or the mutual fund side, I think what we see is regulatory burden only <laughs> increasing. And uh, really uh, uh, our interactions with regulators suggest that uh, they want to have intense regulation across all products. So irrespective of the fact that potentially the uh, investor is more informed, uh, they don't want to go light touch regulation and the only exception being the passive funds. Uh, so I think uh, really before kind of uh, getting too excited about the new asset class, we want to see the regulations that come in. But I think uh, uh, it does look very, very promising. I think uh, the fact is that we will be able to offer more customized solutions to investors. We will be able to offer potentially head solutions to investors. Today, uh, all funds are long only, so uh, you would have seen uh, the board meeting comments that about 25% uh, can be a exposure, uh, can be through derivatives. Uh, we can have differential uh, uh, distribution structures, etc. So I think uh, there are potentially new degrees of freedom that are being uh, uh, offered um, uh, and uh, that is the big opportunity. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we talk about private equity and public markets in India, I think we have been talking from the uh, lens of the investors. Right? Yes. I think uh, another way to look at it is really look at the lens of the companies and their needs. Right? Uh, Fortunately, in India, the primary markets are very buoyant and they are particularly buoyant at this point, uh, uh, this time of the cycle. And so if you see in India, there are already 6,000 companies listed and every day you open the newspaper, another five are getting listed, right? And companies are getting listed in earlier and earlier stage of their life cycle. Right? Oh. So the need for private equity, need for growth capital uh, uh, to go into the unlisted space, probably not as much. Right? To give you some comparison, on NYSE, there are less than 3,000 stocks listed. Right? Yeah. It's a much bigger economy. Right? And actually in the US, in the last uh, few years, uh, the number of private companies has increased. Actually, companies have delisted from the public market and gone private. Mm. Right? Uh, so I think uh, if we look at from that lens that how many companies are public versus how many companies are private, if companies are able to access capital uh, much earlier in their life cycle, and of course, SME IPOs are uh, um, uh, quite a bit in the news, but that just shows that there is public capital available at an earlier stage. So I think that That's also right. puts a kind of uh, uh, some cap on how much private equity will grow. But I completely agree with Sudhi's point that uh, the color of private equity capital will definitely change, uh, like it has changed in the mutual fund side. Right. So, so it's not just the color of private equity, but uh, it's the color of whole AIF and PMS industry is going to change with this new asset class. Uh, Vishal, what is your expert take on this? So it's a very interesting development. And, you know, if you see how uh, Sebi's at least thought about it is that uh, they're looking at an at asset class which is riskier and therefore meant for investors who are sitting in an unregulated space, so to speak, or Category 3 IFs, for example. And they're trying to say that, you know, we recognize that there is a space, there is an opportunity. The industry has matured enough to be able to either explain the nuances of this and to uh, manage expectations and money. And they've created a class. They've recognized that there is you know, a high ticket size and then everybody who's wanting to invest in this, there is an opportunity. Of course, we'll have to wait for the fine prints and see what actually comes out in the regulations. Yeah. It's also a recognition of the fact that uh, experience in the industry has grown. It's been a product that maybe uh, aside of the unregulated piece, even a category three AIF used to run in the past. They're just looking at long shot. And there is an opportunity there as well, right? To recognize that they've done a good job over a period of time. There are returns that are showing up there for the sophisticated investors. And maybe there is an opportunity for the 10 lakh plus investors, again, debate on whether it should be 10, 25, hmm. et cetera, to give them an opportunity to also test that product, which expands the market overall. 
Yes. And if we're talking market expansion, and we also heard on the panel today that uh, you know the private equity class or the category one to three AIFs should also start becoming more commoditized and more common and more popular. Maybe this is one path to get there. That products being done, run here, once they reach a level of maturity, smaller bite-sized portions of those may go into the more regulated mm. industry. But I guess it's generally positive. So do you think that uh, between the mass product of mutual fund and then PMS and AIFs, there was a huge vacuum, yeah. which SEBI is uh, trying to probably fill with this category of new asset class. Uh, but Raghav, uh, there is a balance some adversely impacted uh, categories of asset class and some going to benefit from the new asset class. Give us a summation and is it a game, is it going to be a game changer from whatever we know of the guidelines as of now? I agree with Ashish actually, we'll have to read the fine print. Normally the devil is in the details. So what we see right now obviously is very exciting. There's a lot of new stuff we can do around it. I think but the intention from what we could make out is that there seems to be a lot of unregulated investments in that 10 lakh, 15 lakh rupee category. Mm. So there are a set of people who are getting served who may be the one crore plus investors. Mm. The below bottom of the pyramid is getting served through SIPs which are extremely well regulated. I think this middle of the pyramid was where I think there was a lot of unregulation happening. And if you see every day in the paper there is some scam and some assured return thing happening and some stockbroker giving, un, un, you know, some, some unregulated guy giving bad advice. Mm. So I think that my sense was the reason for it now. I think. Uh, obviously, there's no, it's not a winner-take-all market, so that's the good thing. I think there's, the bottom part will get served by mutual funds. I think the second part, the affluent part will obviously get done with this. You can do a little more tighter investment strategies. You can have maybe more uh, a focused kind of an approach on equity, which you can't do in the mutual fund categories now. Yeah. So cat there are 16 equity categories and you have to fit within those categories. Yeah. So here you can do a little more differentiated stuff. I think the key thing will be to explain the risk-reward to the customer because I think that set of customers is not yet completely financially literate. They are better off than obviously the bottom of the pyramid, but they need a lot of explanation. So I think we'll have to work very closely with our distribution partners to yes. try and figure out which is the appropriate product in which market. Yes. So that we don't have any accidents along the way. So market uh, segmentalization yes. uh, will, will be the yes, evolution. Be yes. But uh, here, uh, getting a little more technical because we have an informed audience here. Uh, so. AIFs will have a much more uh, pronounced job of innovating uh, the public-private combination and tailor-made products and leave the equity. So what happens to the listed uh, space AIFs in this case? Um, so interestingly, we um, are not big supporters of uh, public market equities AIFs. We prefer and we do tell our clients it's better to take the PMS route in such instances. So we like to look at the AIF more through the lens of uh, private markets. Yes. And also at the end of the day, uh, PMS, we would like to think at least for the segment we work in, is a customized strategy for them. And also it becomes from a taxation point of view, they can use whatever the capital gains losses against their other capital gains and losses in other investments as well in order to look at their total taxation. So PMS works better there. Uh, but that's personally how large families look at it. Um, I'm not sure how the others in the room may react. So prima facie, it's looked as like uh, it's a chota PMS, but with mutual funds and uh, with not the t uh, same tax efficiency, which EIFs uh, and PMS would want, but is given to this product for it to become much more popular going forward. So that's the prima facie feedback, but we have to see because this could be a actual game changer. Uh, Ashish, uh, any suggestions on ease of investment, ease of doing business, and uh, how you see the growth potential? So I think uh, on the mutual fund side and generally from SEBI, what we have seen now regulations typically coming after the consultation paper. I think uh, on the AIF side, we have not seen that uh, consistently. So I think uh, as uh, Vishal also mentioned that it's a sophisticated category. Uh, so there should always be an opportunity f to get industry feedback uh, proactively, uh, so and even RBI does that. So everything is preceded by a consultation paper. Of course, uh, after the consultation paper, whether things change or not is a different issue. But at least uh, there should be like a step before the guidelines. 
All right. Uh, that point taken, Vishal. From your uh, point of view on tax as well as regulations, few key pain points for the industry that needs an ease. See, I think at least over the period of time for uh, for the AIFs, uh, a lot of the tax issues have more or less been iron, ironed out. Category 1 and 2, fairly straightforward. We used to struggle with uh, documentation in the past. That's been cleaned up. There are some uh, teething TDS kind of issues which exist, TDS, TCS. Those are operational things. I, you know, it's high time that we get rid of all of this for regulated uh, funds. Category 3, for some reason, is still treated as a paria. It's, uh, you know, kept outside presumably because a pass-through is a benefit given to the uh, Cat 1 and 2, they don't want to extend it to Category 3, makes no sense. Yes. There's a reason, uh, again, like uh, like Swamiya mentioned, it is, it's a category of investors who want to make direct investments, understand what it is, and they're going to pay tax directly. There's no reason to sort of complicate the tax law around. So yes, there is a need to sort out compliance issues around TDS, TCS, yes. there's a need to is uh, make filings easier, make claiming tax credits easier, and category three should just be put on par, should be made easier. Right, even compliance is uh, quite cumbersome in this area. Raghav, any suggestions? No, nothing at this time. I think it's just that the reporting formats, the ease of transaction flow is very, very difficult today. Right. And we see a lot of practical difficulties in you know, getting tax credit back. So that's where I think firms like Vishal's hmm. help us out to solve it. But yeah, they can solve those nuts and bolts I think broadly that's fine. Samia, if you have to add, anything to add? Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, Sudhir, your final comments? No, I think this entire discussion on capital markets is I'm going to still hold the private equity flag high <laughs> and, and continue to say that there has been a lot of regulatory, and you alluded to regulatory uh, stuff, a lot of focus on the nitty gritties, which is okay. It's kind of, it increases operating costs a little bit, but it's not unlivable in the sense that you get the PPM audited by the merchant banks. This is the rules in terms of liquidity. All Everything has to be dematted and so on. Tweaks which are probably kind of more helpful to investors. It's kind of operationally intensive. We will have our comments on why some of these are challenging valuation guidelines that has been released. There is a, There has to be an industry perspective to it. For example, said that audit, only audited results can be used, whereas companies sometimes take four or five months to kind of complete the audited results. So challenges of those kinds, but those are all still minor. I think the bigger areas which remain unaddressed in terms yeah. of leveling the playing field for domestic AIFs vis-a-vis -vis global AIFs in terms of That's right. can you use a little bit of leverage. International a funds can do continuation vehicles. Can yes. you do continuation vehicles? There are structures for permanent vehicles which are there, which kind of are not non-existent. And so these kind of stuff which need to be probably addressed and create opportunities for domestic fund managers to play in the same manner, in the same manner and form and compete with the global. Otherwise you get priced out because you are unable to take leverage. Co-investment structures, for example, SEBI has this slightly, they look upon everything as a, if you are calling yourself a fund, it needs to be diversified. Whereas private capital is not about diversification. Private capital is saying that we have some expertise in this sector, we have access to talent, and we can make an alpha in this. So if you want, a, if you want to attract capital, you need co-investment capabilities. Now in co-investments, you may need to create a vehicle where there are three investors, but you may have only one investment. Today that's not possible because every fund needs to have maximum of 25% per investment. So many of the structures that we have created make it very difficult for domestic private equity funds vis-a-vis -vis global private equity funds. And these don't really add anything. Even from an investor protection perspective, they don't add anything. It is just reflective of a less application of mind to what is the private equity asset class. What is it that they do? It is not, it is while it is called kind of, Somebody was saying, the question was, if you call yourself a fund, there should be diversification. Now, that's not the case. That's right. So these are issues that we face. A lot more support is needed for uh, the homegrown private equity firms. But I must say kudos to this industry because it has helped uh, in making a lot of sectors and companies uh, come in the organized force and also corporatize them and improve the corporate governance uh, side. So it is much more than the money that they have provided. It has has been fit and proper to come to the equity markets so that institutional investors 
can find uh, that support coming in from a, a well-known private equity firm having cleansed the company and made it fit and proper to come to the public market for the small investors to participate in without fear. So that's a very big contribution that has been uh, given by the private equity firm. So my final uh, answer on uh, innovation and of course we have taken a lot of products which have been innovated globally. Indian market was not as experienced earlier, as mature earlier, but now we are getting there. What more potential of innovation that Indian markets is able to like, you know, digest now going forward? How are you seeing the potential going forward? Um, so I, I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the way in which this industry is going to mature. Yes. Uh, we need more people to be able to work with the managers in order to bring the opportunities that they are creating uh, to investors. Uh, certainly, I think in the private market side, I think one of the areas we're definitely going to see is this whole area on secondaries, which hasn't even, we haven't even come to as yet uh, in terms of opportunities as fund lives of private uh, funds comes to an end. So secondaries is a big area. Sectoral funds, specifically around health, around climate, I think these are again spaces which we've not even scratched the surface. And we're just beginning to see a whole wave of private credit uh, as well. So I think these are some of the trends I'm seeing in the private market space over the next 10 That's years. right. And as investor uh, education and penetration grows, uh, then a lot more products can really come to the Indian market. And probably the penetration is faster than what we saw in the last many products. The way we are technologically improving, like that the education of financial products is also improving. And probably the, the lag time between it being adopted with larger public <laughs> Financial, uh, you know, journalists like us are also uh, part of uh, imparting that education. We try to do our best. So uh, thanks so much uh, to everybody. Lots to learn from each one of you. Thank you so much. And thanks for uh, such a patient audience. Thanks. Uh, thank you, panelists, for an insightful discussion. I would like to um, uh, apologize to Mr. Vishal Agarwal because I had forgotten to introduce him, partner, national leader, transaction tax and PE channel for Grand Thornton Bharat LLP. Thank you very much for a very insightful uh, discussion. May I invite uh, Ms. Pinky Mehta, President, uh, for a token of appreciation. Thank you. Please give them a nice round of applause for a very interesting discussion. As we come to the end of an insightful day, I would request uh, Mr. Sandeep Kosla, Director General, to deliver the word of thanks. Thank you, Stina. And uh, good afternoon and thank you to all of you who've come here today. And I hope you found it as interesting as we did. And, uh, you know, how we can all help grow the mutual fund industry and at the same time benefit from him. Uh, we had lovely panel discussion of ISI chat and uh, with Mr. Manoj Kumar from SEBI giving us uh, his perspective as to how the regulator is going to uh, be proactive as we go along. Uh, we have another session now in uh, at 2 o'clock. Uh, so, uh, and that is on SME REITs, a very important subject again. We have... Uh, the executive director of uh, uh, SEBI, Pramod Kumar, who is going to uh, come as a chief guest in that, uh, as a keynote speaker in that particular session. So all of you who want to attend, please stay back after lunch. And uh, my thanks to all our panelists, to our speakers, our president, Pinky Mehta, to Nilesh Bhai and uh, Navneet Munod, who actually put this all together for us. Uh, thanking all our sponsors, HDFC, uh, Mutual Fund, Axis, Grow and Mirai 
uh, without whom this wouldn't have been possible. And uh, lastly, if you are not members, you all can click here and become members because like this we keep on having different uh, uh, sessions, uh, training sessions, knowledge sessions regularly. Uh, so please become members of the chamber.